somewhere out there on that misty marshland is the final resting place of 27-year-old Sidney Bernard, a ship's surgeon who died in 1845. Today we're out on an adventure in the River Medway and we are heading out to Stangate Creek. We're almost at Stangate Creek now, it's just around the corner and look, it's so, so peaceful and beautiful. It's not surprising that Turner felt inspired to paint Stangate Creek, but it hasn't always been this peaceful. It was used as a quarantine base for infected ships. And in 1845, the HMS Eclair was quarantined here when the crew on board her had caught yellow fever. They'd been patrolling the West African coast on anti-slavery duties and there were mosquitoes in the bilge and the men were just literally dropping like flies. And there was a boat called the, or a ship rather, called the HMS Roller who was sent to help because the surgeon and the doctor on the Eclair had all died of yellow fever. And on board the roller was a young doctor called Sidney Bernard, who volunteered to go on board the Eclair and tend to the men. So when the Eclair got back to England, they were ordered to quarantine here in Stangate Creek to avoid spreading yellow fever amongst the population over here. And there was a boat stationed here to guard the HMS Eclair to make sure that nobody could get out and go onto the mainland. So Sidney Bernard tended to the men, that was on 2nd of October when it arrived here, and then by the 3rd of October he himself fell ill and he finally died on the 9th of October of yellow fever and in fact 50% of the Eclair's crew died. Many of them were buried on Dead Man's Island, which is not far from here. But Sidney Bernard, for some reason, was buried on his own. Our visit to Stangate Creek took place in late September 2023. We wanted to be sure that we were not disturbing any breeding seabirds, of which there are many on the islands of the Medway. My hope was to find the grave of Sidney Bernard so I could pay tribute to him by the 9th of October, which would be the 178th anniversary of his untimely death. Very few people know where the grave is, but in 1951, Surgeon Captain R.W. Musson of the Royal Navy wrote that he had visited the grave. He said, the lonely grave was originally marked by an upright inscribed stone, which over the course of time was broken. The stone was then laid horizontally over the grave and surrounded by concrete, in which the iron railings were embedded. It seems that later, as the mud encroached on it and covered the stone, a plaque with a similar inscription was attached to the railings. Surgeon Captain Musson then went on to say, It seems that it will only be a matter of time before the grave is completely covered up by sea and mud. We've set off to have another look for Sidney Bernard's grave and yeah, let's see how we get on with that. It's really marshy terrain, so it's a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. And by now, the grave will be almost completely 
submerged in mud. But we might, we might be lucky, but it's a bit of a challenge. What have we got down here? Part of a cup. With Southern Railway on it. Southern Railway. Oh, nice and muddy. I spotted a lovely green poison bottle down here in one piece. Not to be taken. That's pretty nice, isn't it? Oh, hello, Mr. Crab. Hello. <laughs> They're so brave, aren't they, crabs? It's okay, I don't want to hurt you. I just want to film you, because you're so cool. Now, I have just spotted this bottle here. I thought initially that it was plain. It's not, ooh, <laughs> that's not gonna clean it off much, is it? There is a fox there, and it says, something like Wolf Fox brand. It's got a little fox. Oh, it's got something on the side as well. Tablespoon. But you know, it's not like your usual tablespoon bottle because it's actually got something on it, which is nice. This is mud muddy. I'll put it in there, in my pouch. I'm going to get very muddy. I can just tell. Now just look at this beautiful fragment of plate from a mess. Which mess? We don't know, but maybe, maybe from a mess that was on one of the ships that was quarantining in Stangate Creek. Wouldn't that be incredible? You never know, you never know. It's entirely possible. I'll tell you what, this keeps you fit. Oh la la. Guys, I found it. I found Sydney Bernard's final resting place and it's just here. This is part of the metal surround. Yeah, there it is. This is where he was laid to rest. And as you can see, the surround is pretty much submerged in the mud now. Obviously don't want to disturb it, but I'm so glad that we found it because now I can put some flowers here and just pay tribute to him. See David? Look. Got it. There it is. Thanks. See? Thanks. There's the, yeah. the corner there. There's the, the metal surround so it goes along here. There's the other end here. See, barely visible. We're really lucky actually to have found it. I mean, in a few years time this is oh, going to be completely yeah, yeah, there you go. That's, that's it there. Different. So we can just see the outline of the metal surround here. Here's one corner and it's got like a metal railing. It goes around to here, carries on here and it finally ends here. So this terrain is so marshy. Originally, this would have been completely visible and uh, as you can see it's just completely sunk now and in a few years time I imagine this is going to be completely submerged. Well I'm so glad that we found it and now I'm going to go and pick some flowers to put on the grave. 
Rest in peace, Sydney. Thank you for your service and for all the men that you saved. May you rest in peace. Surgeon Captain R. W. Musson of the Royal Navy wrote in his 1951 article, A Memory of the Eclair, A man from Chatham found a bronze tablet lying in the mud and brought it to the Naval Armament Depot at Upnor. The tablet is in the form of a shield mounted on oak and is engraved, Sacred to the memory of Sidney Bernard, Surgeon of the Royal Navy and son of the late William Bernard Esquire, of Knockleon House, County Dublin, who departed this life the 9th of October 1845 on board HMS Eclair while performing quarantine on Stangate Creek, aged 27 years. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. It is hoped that the plaque will remain in the Royal Naval Hospital, Chatham, as a permanent memorial to Sidney Bernard and possibly also to the other doctors who died in the Eclair. Hi everyone, thank you very much for watching. I hope that you're well wherever you may be in the world. This video is a little bit different to my usual mudlarking video, but I really wanted to take the opportunity to shine a light on the life of Dr Sidney Bernard 178 years after he died. He died on the 9th of October 1845 and so today when I'm releasing this video, my usual time of 5pm GMT on Sundays, it's the day before that 178th anniversary. So it feels like a really good time to share his story with you. I think about Sidney Bernard there in that grave, which has sometimes been referred to as one of the loneliest graves in England. And I wonder how many people visited him over the years. Um, and probably not that many people because it's in such a remote, difficult to reach place. And I'm not talking about now, it's clearly not advisable to go tramping around trying to find him at all. But I mean, I'm talking about earlier when he was first buried there. Did his family come and visit from Ireland? Did they come and see his grave? It's an awful long way to come to such a remote spot. Did he have a wife or a fiance that he left behind that came to visit? Or was it mostly visited by shepherds that lived on the island where he's buried or um, officers or Navy personnel. And so the fact that I'm able now to share his story with you on this anniversary of his death, it makes me feel like he's not completely sort of covered over by time, very much like his grave is, if you see what I mean. So I did a lot of research about uh, Sidney Bernard and I often look in the newspaper archives and um, I came across Indeed, another man, another person who stumbled on Sidney Bernard's grave back in the probably the late 1880s. He was a local geologist. His name was William Hobbs Shrubsole. So it's a little bit of a tongue twister. He was born in 1837 and he was over on the island doing some geological research in the late 1880s and he came across the grave um, in a state of disrepair. He hadn't actually known anything about it at all. He just came across it. Um, he found out a little bit more about it and he actually wrote to the Admiralty to ask them to repair the grave and this they, they did. But I think he was probably quite um, touched by the whole uh, story of Sidney Bernard when he found out more about him because he went on to write several articles and one article he wrote, which was published in the newspaper in um, 19, what was it, 1915, I think. Um, I'm going to tell you properly in a minute because I'm going to read it to you. Um, he, he talks about um, Sidney Bernard's grave and he also talks about the, the, the ships that quarantined in Stangate Creek. 
Now it's a really nice article actually, and it's quite long. And initially I thought, oh, I'll just take out a few little sentences. But the actual article is very informative. It does talk about the quarantining of ships in Stangate Creek. And it also talks about the Eclair and the grave of Sidney Bernard. So I thought I could read this article to you. So this might be a really good time to press pause on the video, go and put the kettle on or pour yourself a drink. Come and put your feet up and listen to me read this article called Quarantine in Stangate Creek, written by W.H. Shrubsoul back in the early 20th century. OK, so you go and do that and I will wait for you here and when you're all ready and settled, I will read the article to you. And who knows, uh, you might find it so relaxing to hear me read this article that you might just fall asleep. <laughs> Although I don't think so, because it's actually very, very interesting. It's far too interesting to fall asleep. OK, I'll see you in a minute. So if you are ready, I will now begin. These are extracts from the article Quarantine in the Medway, written by W.H. Shrubsoul and published in The Guardian and East Kent Advertiser on Saturday the 15th of September 1923. Looking across the turbid waters of the Medway from the railway pier at Port Victoria, a view is obtained of the large, dreary tract of marshland intersected by a labyrinth of creeks and rills. Stangate Creek, one of these, is wide and deep enough at its mouth to afford anchorage for a squadron of battleships. Many of the wooden vessels, which then were plentiful in the Medway, laid up in ordinary, as it was called, were equipped as lazarettes by being roofed over and having louvre boards fitted to the portholes. A large staff of officers and men was appointed under the control of Dr Robert Brown as medical superintendent, to whom a frigate was allotted as a residence for himself and family, it being necessary that he should be there always on the spot. Other vessels furnished needful quarters for the other persons engaged in enforcing the regulations. In these days of rapid transmission of merchandise, some of these regulations seem almost incredible. It was a fact that all ships bound for London from ports beyond the Straits of Gibraltar had to turn aside into the Medway and undergo a period of quarantine at Stangate Creek. Some were treated gently. Ships with fruit from Greece and with general cargoes from Italian ports were soon released and allowed to proceed if no indications of sickness were found. But any that came from plague-infested parts were dealt with severely. It mattered little what the cargo consisted of, whether it was raw silk from Constantinople or Smyrna, cotton from Alexandria, or skins from Barbary or Algiers, the same severe treatment was meted out to all. The bales were transferred to the lazarettes, partially opened and shifted about daily. The crews were mustered and medically examined at frequent intervals, but were not allowed to leave their ships, nor to communicate with the shore. Then, at the end of 25 days, if no disease had become manifest, the cargo was either reshipped or sent on to London in lighters or barges, but no vessel could pass Gravesend without a certificate from the medical officer at Stangate Creek. Every tide brought fresh ships, until at times the Medway was almost blocked with craft of all sorts, sizes and nationalities, thus compulsorily detained. Sometimes there were six or seven hundred vessels at anchor there, awaiting inspection, Ships of the Royal Navy returning to Sheerness or Chatham from foreign stations were also subject to quarantine regulations and received a due share of observation. Nor was this without reason, for it was no uncommon event in those days, when the septic origin of disease was but little understood, for a man of war to return from an unhealthy station with fever patients on board. Such was the case with HMS Eclair, which came home from the west coast of Africa in 1845 with half of her crew sick and dying. 
At her tropical station, nearly all the original crew had succumbed and crewmen had been shipped to fill the vacant places. Even these were not proof against the unhealthy conditions prevailing on board, for while the ship laid at anchor in the medway with the ominous yellow flag fluttering aloft, over 200 of the crew, black and white together, died and were buried in large trenches in the adjacent saltings. Of these burial places there is now no surface indication. When individual interments took place, rough slabs of oak or teak bearing incised inscriptions were usually placed as memorials of the departed. As many burials were in the saltings, which are unprotected from tidal action, scores of these rude monuments in the course of time have been washed away and the graves cut into by the river. Human remains were not unfamiliar objects to those who wandered thither in the interests of science or who skirted the shore in search of firewood and other sea drift. It will scarcely be credited that a man known to the writer was in the habit every summer of collecting the coffins that stuck out of the river bank and after emptying them of their gruesome contents stored the component boards in his backyard as a winter supply of firewood. Of the wooden memorial tablets, not one now remains, and there is little to show where burial has taken place, with one notable exception. Reference to this takes our thoughts back to HMS Eclair in the year 1845. With the limited knowledge of those days, the surgeon of the ship struggled on with the tremendous task of fighting the fever until he also sickened and died, he was buried on Burntwick Island, which, being protected by a sea wall, is not liable to inundation. Someone, to me unknown, caused a stone to be placed at the head of the grave and put a stout oaken post and rail fence around it. On the stone was the following inscription. Sacred to the memory of Sidney Herbert, a surgeon of the Royal Navy and son of the late William Bernard of Nocleon House, Dublin who departed this life on board HMS Eclair while performing quarantine at Stangate Creek, aged 27 years. This solitary memorial could not have been seen by many, for when I visited it last, there was but one cottage on the island, and probably there was none at the time referred to. No one had need to pass that way except a solitary shepherd or occasionally an enthusiastic naturalist. But there stood the solitary gravestone, constituting the place a cemetery, unique alike in its extent and origin, until changes set in that were due to the ravages of time. With the lapse of years, the fence decayed and cattle rubbed against the stone until it fell down and was broken into many pieces. Dirt and vegetation accumulated above, while worms, by their action beneath, facilitated the downward movements of the fragments. A generation passed away and the fact that a grave had been there had almost entirely passed out of knowledge. On inquiry I found that neither the occupier of the land nor the steward of the estate had ever heard of its existence. Local shepherds, fishermen, coast guardmen and others were similarly ignorant. Desirous of seeing it again and being ignorant of the changes that had taken place, the writer had to make several journeys to the island before he succeeded in finding where the stone had stood, for all the fragments had been completely buried by natural agencies. The position of the grave was indicated only by the stumps of the six oak posts that had carried the fence rails. Then, by removing some inches of turf and soil from the enclosed space, all the pieces of the stone were revealed. Seeing that the only memorial of a life lost in the noble endeavour to save others from death was fast becoming non-existent, the writer felt that the grave ought to be restored. Inquiry showed that the family had left the address in Ireland without leaving any clue to their whereabouts. Then I called the attention of the Admiralty to the condition of the grave and submitted a plan for its renewal. With the least possible delay, the Admiralty ordered the work to be done to my satisfaction. In accordance with my wish, the pieces of stone that had been unearthed were embedded in a thick mass of concrete, sufficiently wide to give support to a wrought iron fence, strong enough to resist cattle. 
The erection is therefore far more durable than the one which formerly stood there. It is not a magnificent monument, but it will serve for many years to mark the resting place of one of the many heroes of the medical profession who, in seeking to save life, have lost their own. The sequel is worthy of mention. When a somewhat similar article had been published in Sunday at Home, it was brought to the notice of Dr Bernard, Protestant Archbishop of Dublin, who proved to be a relative of the heroic doctor. By his secretary, he thanked the writer for having sent the articles which he said he was very glad to possess, as he had not heard before of the tragic death of his brave kinsman, nor of the existence of his grave. Thank you very much for listening and I hope that you enjoyed the extracts from the article Quarantine in Stangate written by William Hobbs Shrubsole all those years ago and it's very clear that William really cared a great deal about the state of Sidney Bernard's grave. It's good to see too that over the years efforts have been made to restore and repair the grave Firstly, in the 1890s, when William contacted the Admiralty, and then again in the 1950s, when the Royal Navy stepped up and repaired and restored the grave as best as they could. But it's fighting a losing battle because, by the sheer nature of that marshy terrain, the grave is never going to stay in a very good state. And you can see now the difference between the um, time when it really looked like there was a whole bedstead around the grave and now where you can barely see the tops of the those um, railings it's always going to sink it's so marshy um, it, you know it's only going to stay in a good condition for a short while and so it begs the question do does one really need a perfect grave to remember somebody I mean, when you think about those poor men who were buried on Dead Man's Island, there's nothing at all to mark where they were buried. So maybe, just maybe, telling the story of Sidney Bernard and also the story of those men who were buried on Dead Man's Island is something we can do to make up for the fact that there's either no grave at all or a grave which is rapidly disappearing. What are your thoughts on that? The other things I just wanted to mention before I end this video is that I would really love to know where the plaque, which was originally on the railings, is now. I, I understand that it was in the chapel at the Royal Naval Hospital Chatham, but I haven't quite been able to work out where the Royal Naval Hospital um, Chatham is, to be honest. And so I certainly would love to find out where it is and go and see it if it's actually up on a wall somewhere. That would be really great. So that is um, something that's on my list of things to do. Secondly, I was curious to know if Sidney Bernard was married or if he left behind a fiance. I only found one newspaper article, which I'll put up here, which mentions that he did have a widow but on the other hand, I did see his will and he didn't leave anything at all to a wife. So, so maybe he didn't have a wife. So that is it from me. I hope you enjoyed that video, a little bit different to my usual. And thank you for listening. And thank you again, Sidney Bernard, for all that you did for those men on HMS Eclair. See you soon, everyone. I'll be back soon with more mudlarking adventures. And in the meantime, take care. Sending you lots of love from here in London. Bye bye.
Well, you remember the, the fox bottle I found during that video? Well, I have my own fox. She's actually there on the windowsill waiting patiently. I'm going to turn the light off so that you can see her better. It's a bit glary. One moment. There she is. That's my foxy loxy. And I do have some chicken for her. Hey, Foxy. Hello. Are you waiting for your chicken? Are you waiting for your chicken? <laughs> She's quite shy. So, it's squirrels by day and foxes by night. Let's put her a little bit of chicken outside. There she is. <laughs> so to all of you out there from Foxy, Loxy and I, have a good night. Lots of love from London. See you soon.